All right. Well, we've been on a series talking about the love of God and how to show the love of God and what that love means in our lives and how we can live lives that display the love of God. We've looked at the story in Luke chapter 10 about the Good Samaritan and how he was moved with compassion when he saw the man who was beat, beaten up and left for dead. What we're going to do today is we're going to just kind of shift gears a little bit and see how God loves us day in and day out. And the goal of this is to see how we can have faith and confidence in God's love for us, but also allow that love to flow out to all those around us. So before we begin, let's look to our neighbors. I want you to turn to your neighbors and say, I am loved by God. All right, say it again. I am loved by God. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you are loved by God. You are loved by God. To love means to know someone and to accept someone. To know, to be fully known, and to be fully accepted. We can accept someone, but not really know them. We can say, oh yeah, I accept them, but maybe we don't really know all the details of their lives. If they're a good person or they're a bad person. I remember, I remember a story I heard from, um, <clears throat> from uh, Angie's cousin. He once met, he once met his uh, childhood hero. He was a baseball player. Uh, it was Bo Jackson. I don't know if anybody, you guys probably don't know who he is. Bo Jackson, he was a famous baseball player at the time. And Angie's brother, or sorry, Angie's cousin went and visit and met him at the baseball stadium. Waited for a long time. This was his, his childhood hero. He loved watching him on TV, how he played baseball. And so him and his dad, they went to the stadium to watch the baseball game and they waited to meet him at the end of the game. And he really loved Bo Jackson and he was really you know, excited to see his, his childhood hero. And I remember him telling me the story is that when they actually met him, he was actually very, very rude to the fans around him. And so when he finally got to know him, he's like, oh man, he's not such a great guy after all. He accepted him, but he didn't really know him. But when he finally got to know him, he's like, man, he's not such a great guy after all. I'm, I'm sure he still enjoyed watching him on TV, but kind of his character turned him off a little bit. Being truly loved is being fully accepted and fully known. We can accept someone, but not fully know them. Or we can fully know them, but not fully accept them. Oh, we know their character, or we know their past. We kind of, oh, uh, you know, there's no hope for him, or there's no this or that. You know, I know what they did. I know who they are, and we accept, we, 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 we know them, but we don't really accept them. But our Heavenly Father, He fully knows us. You are fully known by God. The good, the bad, the ups, the downs, and you are fully accepted by God. God sees everything. God sees everything. And He fully loves you. There is no love like the love that our Heavenly Father has for us. Amen? Say it again to your neighbor. I am loved by God. In the Bible, there was a, one of the disciples of Jesus. His name was John. And he wrote the Gospel of John. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John, The book of John, if we read it and compare it to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's different from all the other Gospels. 
But if you read it, it's really written from a perspective of a disciple who has an intimate relationship with Jesus. And then if you read some of the other books that he wrote, Mar uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, we see that there's a common theme through a lot of these, and it's the theme of love. And I want to read to you a few verses that John wrote about himself. Okay, listen to this. Okay, so this is when, um, when Jesus was being crucified. It says, this is, this is John writing about what Jesus said. When Jesus saw his mother, talking about Jesus' his mother, Mary, and, listen to this, and the disciple whom he loved. Now, this is John writing about himself, saying, Jesus saw Mary and me, the disciple who Jesus loved. That's how he wrote about himself. He said, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom Jesus loved, Standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Here's another verse. This was after the tomb was empty. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. John was saying, I'm the one who Jesus loved. I'm the one who Jesus loved. Uh, let's read again in John 21, verse 7. The disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter. He didn't say, John said to Peter, or I said to Peter. He said, the disciple whom Jesus loved. It's really interesting how, how John talks about himself. Because sometimes it sounds like he's bragging. <laughs> he's like, yeah, all those other guys, all those other disciples, Jesus doesn't love them. But I am the disciple that Jesus loved. I don't think it was anything like that. I think it was a, 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 a heart of humility that says, Jesus loves me so much. Jesus loves me so much. And yeah, Jesus loves all the other disciples, but he's just expressing not... knows everything about me and he accepts me he loves me and so it's a theme that we see all through what John was writing and if you read first John and second John we see lots of other verses that talk that where John was talking about love and he says this is love not that we loved God but that he loved us and gave his life for us this is love but there's another interesting theme in the book of John that isn't in any, of, any other book of the Bible. He uses a certain word to describe the Holy Spirit. And it's this word helper and comforter. He uses this word in, first, in, sorry, in John chapter 14, verse 26, when Jesus was telling his disciples that I'm gonna go to the cross and I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And this is how Jesus describes the Holy Spirit, and John wrote it in the book. Jesus says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I said to you. So this word, Helper, this word, Helper, some versions, they call him, they call the Holy Spirit the Comforter or the counselor, okay? Because it's a unique word. No other, no other person in the New Testament uses this word. In John, uh, in the, in the um, Christian Standard Bible, it says, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. This verse is also used in uh, John 14, verse 16, John 15, John 16. It's also used in 1 John 2, verse 1. But what this verse, what this word means, it means to comfort. It means to help. But what it has the idea of is someone calling for somebody to come and help. And that person comes and helps. That, that advocate, that some, someone, it's like a child saying, Mom, 
Mom, come help me. Daddy, I need your help. Come help me. And that person responds. That person comes. And that's what the word helper, comforter, and counselor means. It's one who responds to our cries for help. God is a God who sees, but God is a God who responds as well. When we call out to him, he comforts us by coming to us and helping us. He's a God who responds. I want to read one more story in the Old Testament. It's kind of a, an illustration from the, the New Testament, but I want to go back to a story in the Old Testament, and it's the story of Hagar. Now, Hagar is, was the, the servant, the female servant of Sarah. She was an Egyptian, and if you read the story in, in um, Genesis 12, Moses, and, or sorry, Abraham and Sarah traveled to Egypt, and they stayed in Egypt during a famine. When they left, it says that they left with a lot of uh, cattle and donkey and livestock, but it also says male and female slaves. So this is probably where Hagar came from. She was Abraham's, she was Sarah's female slave. And if you know the story, what happened, Sarah couldn't have children, so Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham, and Hagar conceived. But when she conceived, she became, a, she became proud, and there became, there, there became some friction between her and Sarah. So what Sarah did is she sent Hagar away. Or, or, sorry, she didn't send Hagar away. Hagar ran away because of the friction and the, 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 the bad treatment that Sarah was, was giving to her. Let's pick it up in Genesis chapter 16. We're going to read verse 7 to 16. And it says, The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur, S-H-U-R. Shur is a town that was on, this, on the border of Palestine and Egypt. So Hagar was going to Shur, but she was probably on her way back to Egypt. That's where she was headed. She was going back to a place she knew, a place that she was familiar with. But the angel of the Lord said to her, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? Hagar said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So Hagar called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. You are a God of seeing. Now, this is the first time we see in the, in the Bible when we see the angel of the Lord appearing to a man, to a person. The angel of the Lord, most scholars would say that it's a physical, uh, it, it's God come to earth in a physical body. Either God or Jesus come to earth in a physical body to talk to somebody. And the very first time it happened was to an Egyptian slave named Hagar. An Egyptian slave named Hagar who was shunned, who was, she was, the Bible says she, there was contempt between her and Sarah. There was some pride going on there. But God appeared to her and said, I see you. I see you. And Hagar said, this God is the God who sees. This God is a God who knows. She called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. So we see it's not just a normal angel that came to her because she says, you are God. You are the God who sees. She said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. 
And that means the well of the God who sees. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abraham a son, and Abraham called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abraham. See, with Hagar, nothing changed in her outward situation. But she had strength because she knew that God sees her. So God is a God who sees. God is a God who comes and comforts. God is a God who responds. God doesn't just leave us by ourselves, but God is a God who sees. And if God is a God who sees now, if God is a God who sees us in our present situation, that means that God is a God who saw us in our past situation. Maybe you have situations in your past where you wonder, where was God? Where was God in that moment? What was God doing? Why did he leave me? Or maybe you have a future situation. You don't know what's going to happen. If God is a God who sees, God is a God who saw in your past, and God is a God who will see you through in the future. Amen? That's who our God is. And with Hagar, she had to go back to Sarah. And we see later on as we read, there was still more tension. There was still more difficulties that happened. But Hagar knew that God is a God who sees. Your difficulty, the stuff that you're facing in life, is not invisible to God. You are not invisible to God. You are not someone that God doesn't notice. Sometimes we feel like people overlook us or they don't think about us or, you know, they, they don't care about us. Maybe they don't, but God does. God sees. God knows. God is a God who sees. And we see in the, in the Bible, we see that God has many, many names. When Hagar met God, she said, this, I have seen the God who sees me. I have seen the God who sees me. I want you to know today that God sees you. God sees you. And that is comfort enough. That is help enough. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you. Amen? Amen. Take heart. Lose your fear. God is here. God is with us. God is with you. Maybe when you go out these doors, Maybe you feel like being in church, this is a safe place. And then when you go out these doors, you're going to feel, feel all the stress again. You're going to feel all the worry. You're going to feel all the difficulties. But know that as you go out, God sees you. God sees you here. God sees you there. Take that to heart. Be like Hagar. I can go in strength because God sees me. You know, Hagar wasn't perfect. Hagar wasn't perfect. It says that she was full of pride when she found out that she was, that she had conceived and Sarah didn't. And that's what caused some of their, their, their difficulties. Maybe the situation, the difficulty that you're facing comes a little bit from you. You know, we all have our weaknesses. We have, all have our own things that get us into trouble. But God, God still sees you. Maybe it comes from outside. Take heart that God sees you. Let's all stand together. What I'd like for us to do is I'd just like to spend, I'd just like us to spend a couple of minutes responding to God and his love. Let's just close our eyes in God's presence and say, God, I thank you that you see me. And if there is a situation that you're going through right now, that comes to the front of your mind, that's so difficult, that's so stressful, 
that brings you a lot of worry, give it to God. Say, God, you see me in this situation. You see me in the middle of, and then tell him what it is. And say, God, I thank you that you see me in this situation. Let's just spend a couple of minutes saying this to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who sees. You are the helper. You are the comforter. And we are the people that you love. And so, God, I thank you in our situation, our fear and our inner worry and in our stress. God, you are here and you see. God, and we thank you for your faithfulness, God. Lord, I pray for every heart that's broken. I pray healing. Lord God, and I pray comfort in the fact that you are here and that you see. Maybe the pain is in the past. God, you are a God who sees past, present, and future. You see and you know. God, I just speak healing. I release your healing to every heart and every soul and every mind. And we thank you for your love. We thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, God, that we are fully known and that we are fully accepted. We rejoice in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Scripture came to my mind in Second uh, Chronicle 16:9. It says, "The eyes of the Lord look to and fro." That means back and forth across the earth, searching for those whose heart is wholly His, is completely His. I want to encourage you today. God is saying, "There's nothing that is." a confirmation because he just preached everything that was like in what I felt like God was giving to me. So this week, you know, today even if you want to go back for prayer, God sees you. Make sure your heart is wholly his, totally his because it's in that surrender that you can trust him completely and when when you, you set your heart upon him in that way, the eye eyes of the Lord turn and they say, I see you. I see you. I see you. God is for you today. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. God is good. God's faithful. Amen. God sees you. Go in boldness knowing that God sees you.